Psalm chapter 12. Very good. I want to thank the Key family for this beautiful Bible. Uh, Jamie's dad, Jack Key, passed away recently, and when the day the funeral was taking place, we were waiting for the family to come back for the dinner after the graveside service, and I was sitting in Jamie's dad's house and opened this Bible up. It's called the Chronological Study Bible, and it's just a beautiful Bible inside. It's got a lot of maps. It's got on every page all kinds of color and beautiful pictures and charts and everything, and, and I thought, man, this is a beautiful Bible, and today Jamie brought this to church today, and on the inside it says, for the fa from the family of Jack Key to Pastor Bob 2020. So thank you, Key family. Give them a big hand. Yeah, it's pretty cool to go through the Bible chronologically. You know, this is a Bible where it takes you from the beginning to the end. It's really great. All right. Psalm chapter 12. You know, I've been doing a lot of prophecy lately, so this Sunday I decided, you know what, I'm going to bring back, uh, go back to the Psalms and take a little hiatus from the book of Daniel, and, uh, and we're going to get back to the book of Daniel, but with everything that's swirling around us, all around us in every way, so many different uh, issues and troubles and problems, uh, I wanted us to look at this very special psalm in light of this for you and your family, and of course for everybody that's joining us uh, online, we thank God for every person that's with us today, and hope this will be a great help. Psalm chapter 12, it says, to the chief musician, okay, remember psalms are songs. These, this is uh, Israel's hymn book. This is their praise and worship music. In fact, believe it or not, so many songs that we sing week after week, a lot of times you may not even recognize it because, you know, they don't do the words exactly as it's read in the book of Psalms, but a lot of times we're singing right out of the psalms as a church. David writes to the chief musician on an eight-stringed harp, a psalm of David. Verse 1 says there, Help, Lord. <laughs> I know none of you have ever said that. <laughs> Help, Lord, for the godly man, the godly person, ceases. For the faithful disappear from among the sons of of men. They speak idly, every one with his neighbor. With flattering lips and a double heart they speak. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaks proud things, who have said, With our tongue we will prevail. Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now I will arise, says the Lord. I will set him in safety. I will set him in the safety for which he yearns. The words of the Lord are pure words. Like silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. You shall keep them, O Lord. You shall preserve them from this generation forever. The wicked prowl on every side when vileness is exalted among the sons of men. If we go back just six years to January. 16th of 2014, Fox News reported that a 66-year-old woman in San Jose, California, had been duped out of $500,000 after being scammed by a man on the internet uh, dating site that was called ChristianMingle.com. ChristianMingle.com. The Santa Clara uh, County Deputy District Attorney Cherie Burlard said this. She said that the man posing as David Holmes, that's the name he gave, David Holmes, posing as David Holmes, an Irish citizen working on a Scottish oil rig, wooed the woman with 
flowers, phone calls, and text messages. One time, he even spent 90 minutes with her on the phone when her car battery went dead and hired someone to come to her aid. He even prayed with her. <laughs> he got on the phone as that whole thing was, you know, conspiring and she was probably all in a, in a you know, tizzy because she's on the side of the road while he's praying with her and just, uh, just trying to comfort her. But he the district attorney, Borlard, told CBS this. You get the love drug in you, and you end up getting duped. They never met in person. You get the love drug in you, and you end up getting duped. They never met in person. Now, the man who, according to Borlard, used a picture of a male model on his profile, <laughs> convinced the woman to invest $500,000 into a, a fake oil rig. And according to the San Jose Mercury News, she had to not only dip into her life savings, she, she took and she refinanced her house in order to invest $500. So she might have had her whole house paid off. She was in her 60s. And she might have just said, OK, I'm going to do that so I can get all $500,000. Well, unfortunately, the scammer was busted when his Skype and his email addresses were traced back to Africa, Borland said. Now, thankfully, thankfully, the woman was able to recover $200,000 that was still in a Turkish bank that hadn't gotten wired all the way to Africa, but unfortunately, the scoundrel in Africa was out and about with her $300,000 and was nowhere, of course, to be found. Now, I don't know if the woman from San Jose, California, was a believer in Christ or not. And I don't know uh, how things went for her in the, uh, in the months after that. I don't know how things turned out for her, but I do know this. I do know this, because of a deceptive and a smooth-talking man, she lost a huge amount of money that she may never, ever recover. Probably not. Now, a lot of people would say, well, that's her fault for allowing herself to be duped, and, and uh, you know, and they might take that take on it. But the truth of the matter is this, everybody. Think about this. The truth of the matter is a really evil person preying on probably either a divorced or a widowed woman, preying on a woman, pouring all kinds of lavishness on her, flowers and, can and all this stuff, took advantage of her, lied to her, took advantage of her to steal what didn't belong to him. So wrong, it's so evil. And the internet is a con artist's dream. You know, there's access to all kinds of people. In fact, let me just tell you this about, I think about 10 or 15 years ago, there was an older lady in our church, probably in her mid to late 70s, and she, this very same thing happened to her. She called me one day and she said, Pastor Bob, she said, uh, you know what, I'm about to make a donation to the church of $100,000. I said, you gotta be kidding me. I didn't, had no idea she had so much money. And she said, no, she said, listen, I just sent $5,000 and I'm going to make a million dollars. They said, if you'll send me $5,000, i will make a million dollars and I'm gonna tithe on that. And I said, you didn't happen to send that, you ha didn't happen to have sent that already, did you? And she said, yes. And so I, I broke the news to her and she, she just couldn't believe me. She said, no, no, no. Now, if that's not bad enough, she got taken again. She did the same thing and got scammed after I begged her. Don't do these things. These people, there's a million people out there like that. Anyway, the uh, Internet's a con artist's dream. And this type of fraud is commonplace. There's pyramid schemes, there's Ponzi schemes, you name it. Name it. You know, not too long ago, we talked about Bernie Madoff and, and that whole situation and so many others. Vulnerable and defenseless people end up getting burned. We live in a world, and listen to me everyone, we live in a world that's filled with deceptive 
and evil, evil people. They wouldn't think twice about hurting you, deceiving you, ripping you off. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've tried to hire people around the church to work, either in the parking lot or do something, and they look you right in the eye and, you know, they say, hey, could you, could you pay me today? You know, can you pay me half today? And, you know, and, and, you know, I'm like, well, you should do the work and all that kind of stuff. And they look you right in the eye. Pastor, I would never do that. I would never, and they're gone. <laughs> it's just a terrible thing, but that just happened. It's just we live in a rotten, sinful world. Now, question everybody is this. What does God's word say to us? What does Psalm chapter 12 say to us in light of the fact that you and I, who are trying to do the right thing, are living in a world surrounded by a lot of people who don't have any interest in doing that? They'd be more than happy. Man, if they could only figure a way out, they would take every dollar in your bank account, they would take your car, they would take the things in your house. And listen, there's a lot of bad people in the world. And so David's right in the midst of this in his world. And so that's what I'd like to talk to you about. The, the title that I've given today is this, What to Trust in an Evil World. We could have said who to trust or what to trust. It ends up being the same thing, but that's what I'm going to talk about. Three simple lessons here this morning but so important and I hope that it'll just encourage you when you leave here today you'll say yes yes that yes I need to be focusing on these things all right let's bow our heads for prayer everyone father we ask that you'll use this in the lives of your people both near and far Lord uh, Lord I thank you for all those people that tune in all all really around the country Lord it's just uh, amazing and I just ask that your blessings will rest on them as well as those are, who are here with us. And that, Lord, you'll use your word. God, just be mighty in our hearts and lives today. And we ask it in Jesus' precious name and for his sake. Amen. Now again, <laughs> listen, if you turn on your television set, it won't be very long before a, a, a story will come on, a, a one-hour uh, newscast or a one-hour uh, story about you know somebody's life a bio or something where people are getting scammed or ripped off it's just happening a lot but you know what this has been happening since Adam and Eve I'll, I'll give you a for instance I want you to see some of the words that God was saying listen not to pagans outside of Israel not to pagans outside of Jerusalem God's saying this to his people this is mind-boggling. He's saying it to his own people, the apple of his eye. In the book of Amos in the Old Testament, this is ancient Israel. My people, God says, have forgotten how to do right, says the Lord. Their fortresses, their homes, their castles. Maybe some of these people were powerful and they had big homes. They had fortresses. Their fortresses are filled with wealth taken by theft and violence. Okay, number one, everybody, this teaches us something important. It's not just pagans that could be evil, it's God's people that can be evil. There's a lot of pastors that teach that if you're really a Christian, you won't do bad things. They have no earthly idea of how silly, I mean, man, don't they even ever confess their own sins, let alone, you know, go to God about the sins of the people they're ministering to? I mean, really? That's just preposterous. Or they might say something like this, oh, they'll, Christians will sin, but they just won't sin badly. Well, I don't know about this, but this says God's people are thieves and violent. <laughs> okay, what about Ezekiel? What did he have to say about this? Your princes, okay, these are people in office. Your princes plot conspiracies just like lions stalk their prey. Picture that. Picture their teeth bared, saliva coming out of the lion's mouth, just ready to dig its teeth. That's how their, their uh, um, political world was back in Ezekiel's day. They devour innocent people. Who pays the price? Yeah, the poor, the hurting. They devour innocent people, seizing treasures and extorting wealth, Extor ex uh, extortion. Think about that. They go over there and they say, hey, listen, uh, you're either going to do this or we'll throw you in jail. 
or something like that. You either do this or we'll take away all of your sheep and goats or whatever. Go down a few verses. Oh, the end of the line there. They make many. Think about this. They make many widows. Hey, everybody, how do you make a widow? <laughs> you have to kill her husband. So they're not only ripoffs, they're murderers. God's people. You say, Pastor Bob, that's not possible. Oh, yeah? Well, you haven't read your Bible lately. Go to 1 Peter chapter 4, where the apostle Peter, who was Jesus' right-hand man, says this to God's people. Don't any of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, or a busybody. I just listened to it this morning. Let not any of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, or a busybody in other people's business. So that, what's that telling us? Christians can be murderers. David, Moses, <laughs> go down the list. Peter tried to be, and isn't that interesting? Peter tried to be a murderer. He wanted to get the, the high priest's guy, uh, his right-hand guy. They wanted, he wanted to cut his head off, but he only got his ear. <laughs> the guy ducked or something. But, you know, so Peter could relate to that very well. He got so angry, he was willing to, to murder somebody. So he said, don't any of you Christians suffer as murderers, thieves, or busybodies. It's evil. Evil, evil, evil. Okay, let's go on four verses down here in verse 29. The people of the land. Okay, this is Israel. This isn't pagans in Moab, pagans in uh, Philistia, pagans outside. No, this is God's people. The, the people of the land have used oppressions. Okay, you oppress other people. You crush them. Committed robbery. Mistreated the poor and needy. And wrongfully oppress the stranger. Those are the outsiders, the foreigners. They take advantage of them. They say, ah, these people, they're, they're just slaves. They're just, you know, and they just, horrible, horrible. So everybody, what does Psalm 12 tell us as followers of God? What does it tell us to do in a world filled with violent, cruel, dishonest people? So many people that wouldn't have any problem pulling a gun out and just plugging you. And we've seen it, haven't we? In recent weeks there, I think, I don't know if it was in San Francisco, but that person walked up, a, a, a female police officer and a male police officer were just sitting in their police car, and this guy walked right up, and they had it on video, and he pulled a gun, and he nearly killed both of those police officers. The woman got shot through the jaw, and the other police officer had more serious, and she's over there with her jaw all shot up, calling on her thing, barely able to talk and saying, quick, get an ambulance, we're losing, you know. And folks, our world is filled with people like that. So what are we to do? Okay, lesson one. Lesson one is this. It has to do with being people of prayer. We are to faithfully continue in prayer to God. That's so important, everybody. If we're going to be salt and light in this world, we need to be people of prayer. If we're going to make an impact, now again, if, if you're not really, if you haven't really been praying a lot or maybe at all, let me just tell you this. I'm not saying that you should start tomorrow and say, oh, I'm going to pray for 30 minutes or I'm going to pray for an hour. No, you start where you're at and you start building yourself up, okay? You start building it up. And by the way, if you want a wonderful outline for prayer, Take the Lord's Prayer, okay? It really could be called the Disciples' Prayer. Our Father in heaven, may your name be honored. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Lord, feed us, clothe us, Lord. Help us. Give me your resurrection. You know, you go through that prayer. It's a great place to start. And you can use it. But by the way, I just used the Lord's Prayer, but now I've stretched my prayers out to a fairly long time in that as my outline. But I still use it day after day as my outline of prayer. Now let's look at chapter 12 again here. And what's, how's David praying? 
Okay, he's surrounded by all these corrupt people, people in government that are corrupt, people that are in local government corrupt, people that are surrounding them that are corrupt. Help, Lord. Help, Lord, because the godly man, the godly person ceases. They're not to be found. I can't find any. Everybody around me is a low life. For the faithful, good people, godly people, they disappear off the earth from among the sons of men. In other words, among humans. The faithful, good people, it's like they're not even around anymore. Everybody is out for themselves. These people, they speak idly, every one with their neighbor. They flatter them. On the outside, they're telling them all the things they want to hear. But you know what? On the inside, they're like, hey, one false move by that person, and I'm taking them down. I'm I'm stealing their money. I'm taking whatever, you know what I mean? They're just, on the outside, they're trying... What, hey, what did that guy do in the beginning to that woman? Well, he's sitting at a computer typing in Africa, acting like he's a model from Ireland. And he's over there typing away, loving on her, saying sweet things to her, and, and buttering her up for the kill. See, flattering with the lips. They, with flattering lips and a double heart, they're hypocrites. They're, what they're saying isn't what's in here. Uh, they speak with a double heart and with flattering lips. And look at David prays. I love this. And you know what? You need to pray this. You need to pray this. People messing with you, oppressing you. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaks proud things. We get, we get a principle here, everybody, that we ought to be praying for God to intervene. Now, again, this isn't literal. You know, God's not interested in us wanting our neighbor to have his lips missing and his tongue. That would not be pleasant. But what he's doing is, is he's using hyperbole. He's like saying, Lord, take them out. Lord, do whatever you have to do to stop that. Okay? Like, you know, you see people going in and destroying other people's businesses because they think that's right to do. Hey, listen, people have every right in America to protest everything. You can protest in America whatever you want to protest. This is America. All right? You, as a citizen of America, have a right, according to the Constitution, to gather together and protest peacefully, but you do not have a right to go into a downtown area of a city and destroy one person after another's life savings that they work day and night. Hey, think if that was you. Think if for 20 years you work day and night from 6 in the morning till 9 o'clock at night trying to make your business run and keep the people employed and keep them paid, and then in one night, evil people destroy. Okay, they do not have a right because they've broken the law of God. And by the way, I've told you this many times, in the Ten Commandments, you got the two sides of the Ten Commandments. You got our responsibilities to God and the responsibilities to men over here. And very high toward the top. Of course, you got murder, adultery, and then you got theft. Thou shalt not steal. Okay? That's very, very, you know, do you think God cares about that? You better believe it. By the way, you don't have to do this, and God didn't ask me to do this. I just wanted to do it. When I was unsaved as a teenager, I ripped off a lot of people. I calculated it up. I think I took about $2,000 in, two th in money in people's possessions. And you know what I did? I saved up. It took a long time. But I saved little by little. I saved up $8,000. And every person that I knew that I could still contact, otherwise I just put it into, uh, into God's kingdom work, but every person I knew, former bosses and things like that, I wrote them a letter, told them I had become a Christian, that I was sorry for what I did, and, and uh, I say, I think that what I took from you was probably worth around $500. I'm giving you four times as much. I'm giving you $2,000. I did that for every person. Didn't have to, but I read about Zacchaeus doing that in the Bible, and I thought, you know, that would, be, that would really make an impact. And I put, a, I put a gospel tract in the envelope and told them, I'm a new man. The things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. There's been a great change since I've been born again. 
All right, everybody? So David is praying on the behalf of the entire nation. It's gotten so bad. He cries out to God. He says, help, Lord. He prays to God that they'll, he'll cut off these smooth-talking people. Lord, silence these arrogant liars who only say what they want to say and they won't listen to anyone. So in the midst of a corrupt and vile world, listen, you can pray for people to get saved. You can pray for everybody to get saved, but you can also pray for rip-offs and oppressors and, and deceivers and murderers. You can pray and say, God, intervene and make life miserable for those people until they come to the knowledge of the truth. It's right there in the Bible. David did it, and we should do it. And don't let any people around you manhandle you. You take them to God and sick God on them in Christian love. <laughs> But you get the idea. God means business. And he has no problem with his children praying to, to stop evil, evil people. God, wa God wants us to pray about those things. All right? Elizabeth Elliot, whose husband, Jim Elliot, was martyred on a South American mission field, said this about prayer. She said this. She said, whoops, she said, the saint... The Christian who advances on his or her knees never retreats. In other words, she's saying, show me a Christian that's a faithful prayer warrior, that does it regularly, you know, not like, don't use God like a, flat, a spare tire in your trunk, okay? Don't use God in case of emergency. Oh, God! <laughs> My life's collapsing. No, no. Use them as your steering wheel. When you get in a car, every time you get in the car, if you're the driver, you're going to have your hands on the steering wheel. Same thing with prayer. Use it regularly. Don't get it out of the trunk in case of emergency every five years. That's not the way God wants us to live. He wants you and you and you to live in fellowship with him in prayer. Okay, so now notice in verse 5, what God does in answer to King David's prayer, because this is taking us to our next lesson, what he does in answer to King David's prayer uh, for the nation of Israel. And I'm going to paraphrase it, okay? I'm going to paraphrase it. Because of the violence done to the poor and because of the agonizing cries of the needy, now, this is God speaking, now I will arise. I will rescue and protect them. Isn't that great? David's saying, Lord, help, Lord. And God's sitting on his throne, and he gets up. And he says, I like that prayer. I'm getting up. I'm getting up, and I'm going to do something about this. Isn't that awesome? Now, sometimes God allows bad things to happen to you and I. Often, things go belly up. This breaks down. This this is messed up. This happens. There's, uh, there's uh, arguments and there, there's different things and God allows, God allows bad things to happen. But, let me just say this. Sometimes when God's people are getting hammered from the outside by bad people, God just says, enough, enough. I'm tired of this. My children have suffered enough and I'm stepping in. Amen? He stands up and he puts an end to their suffering. So lesson number one, we are faithfully to continue with God in prayer. And lesson number two, we are to patiently, to faithfully pray, to patiently wait for the help of God. David cried out to God, and you know what? He waited patiently for God. Okay? Now, let me illustrate. If you've ever been to a circus with flying trapeze artists, okay, you know how scary it is when the flyer lets go of the trapeze. Okay, you've got the catcher and you've got the flyer. The flyer is going back and forth. I mean, those, those, uh, those uh, wires are like, man, 30 feet long and they're just whipping back and forth. And you know what? He gets it going so high and when it gets up to the crescendo, the flyer lets go and he's just sitting there like this. And he lets go. And all he's doing, everybody, is by faith. He's not trying to catch anything. You understand? He's let go. 
and in total trust of the catcher, he says, all right, I'm in the right place at the right time. Now, hopefully the catcher is in the right place at the right time. And he just ke keeps his arms out and waits till he feels this giant grip, grip those arms. And then he can grip the catcher's arms. You get it? All right. There's a very special relationship between the flyer and the catcher on trapeze. So as the flyer swings high above the crowd, the catcher comes in. See, there's the flyer on the right, and you got the catcher who's still wired on the left. But they're flipping and flying. It's just amazing how they time it and do all those things. And so, anyway, the catcher's or the flyer's job is to remain as still as possible. Did you hear that? The flyer's job is to remain as still as possible and wait for the strong hands of the catcher to pluck him from the air. A member of the famous trapeze troupe called the Flying Rudellas once said this, the flyer must never try to catch the catcher. The flyer must wait in absolute trust. The catcher will catch him, but he must wait. Wow. And Christian brothers and sisters, so must we. We've got to pray faithfully. But then you know what you need to do? You need to wait on your mighty God. You need to wait on your mighty God. Okay? God is a promise-keeping God. We must pray, but we must wait. He's going to deal with evildoers. Not one of his promises will fail to us. And that's exactly why King David is able to say to his readers in the following verse, verse 6, David is able to say this. It seems like he's going way off on another topic, but he's not. Because he says, you're waiting on a God who makes promises. His word is good. He keeps his word. He never goes back. God who cannot lie, Titus 1-2. The words of the Lord. The words of the Lord are pure words. What are they like? They are like silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. That means they melt it, let it harden, take off the garbage, melt it again, take off whatever garbage is remaining, let it harden, melt it again each time, less and less garbage. Now, God's word never had garbage, but what he's saying is, my word is just like silver that's been purified seven times. There's nothing more to burn out of it. It's pure silver. You melt it, all that's left is silver. And God's saying, you know what? My word is totally, completely trustworthy. Now, follow me, everybody. I just did a class this entire week on bibliology, on the study of God's word, okay, the theology of the Bible. And there are definitely things in the Bible, like it records people lying, right? Okay? Okay, there, there's, there's literally, okay, like Satan talking to Adam and Eve, right? Satan's giving them a story. And there's things like that in the Bible. And there's things in the Bible, like in the Old Testament times when they were talking about uh, battles and war and they were like we had Israel had 10,000 people and 6,000 of them perished in the war and then maybe you'll read somewhere else where it says and 6,293 people perished and say, ah, see, see the Bible's got errors in it look 6,000 here 6234 here but but folks you know, it's the same thing that we do every day. God, God in his word, hey, many times if we're talking and interacting with people, we'll just say, you know, well, man, how many people were at that rally you saw on TV? Man, there's 10,000 people there. Okay, you just told your wife that. There's 10,000 people there. The next day on the news, the guy comes on and says, yesterday in uh, Salt Lake City, there were 12,500 people at this rally. Your wife doesn't turn to you and say, you liar. You dirty, rotten liar. 
You told me yesterday there were 10,000, and they just said 12,500. I'll never talk to you again. <laughs> okay, you get it. Okay, so the Bible has stuff in there like that. But you know what? God's word is pure. Okay, there's, there's answers to, to little things like that, minutia. They, they are very ably answered. Some of them, some other things, not so ably. But nonetheless, I want to tell you this. There's the old bumper sticker that says, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. No, the, really the bumper sticker should just say, God said it, that settles it. <laughs> Doesn't matter whether I believe it or not. God said it, that settles it. Now, it does matter, like, as far as my eternal destiny is concerned, it matters if I believe it, and it matters as far as my, uh, my, my uh, flourishing in life, okay? Yeah, I want to take God at his word, but all I'm saying is this. This word is God's word. He's sustained it these thousands of years. Think of all the books that are written every day, everybody, and in a hundred years, they'll be in the dustbin. Now, of course, we have electronics now, so, but nonetheless, there's been so many millions of books written across history that nobody even knows about. But think about this. This book remains. It remains. And God prospers it and blesses it and continues to use it in people's lives. People open up the Gideon Bibles in in hotel rooms not, not knowing where to turn anymore and they end up becoming believers in Jesus and sign their name in the line in the back of the Bible. It's an awesome, awesome thing. So folks, as godly people who have to live in the midst of a godless society, we have to be people of prayer. We've got to faithfully continue in prayer. Number two, we've got to patiently wait. Once you pray, wait on God. Lord, you're taking so long. Wait on God. Wait on God. I think the psalmist was the one who said, I shall yet praise him who is the help of my countenance. The one who, in other words, the one who's going to turn my frown into a smile. I will yet praise him. I will yet, you know, he's going in prayer, but the Lord... I'm going to wait patiently on you in one day. Glory to God, I'm going to see, maybe not what I wanted, but what you wanted. I'll see something and I'll stand back and say, I like it. It's better than what I wanted. Okay, that's number two. Number three, everybody. Number three. This is their last lesson. Psalm 12 says you and I are not only to faithfully pray, patiently wait, we're to vigorously all our might cling to the promises of God. That's God's pure word, purified seven times. The world, the world is filled with liars, but the word is filled with truth. Let me repeat that. The world around you is filled with liars, but the word is is filled with truth. It's God's truth. What can we trust in an evil and dishonest world? The words of God. Pure words. Tested. Proven over and over again. There's no deception in them at all. God isn't deceiving anybody. Not once. They're like silver. That's been purified seven times. There it is. There's a bar of silver. It's beautiful when you get to see it on your computer screen. It's just, just like so shiny and perfect and wonderful. That's God's word. Perfectly pure, perfectly reliable. And you know what, everybody? As the world around us, and listen, everyone, it's undoubtedly going to get worse and worse. As the world keeps casting off the very beliefs that you and I cherish... Okay? Hey, didn't Paul say 2,000 years ago that there's these unrighteous people who are pushing down, they're suppressing the truth? They're suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. 
It's been happening for thousands of years, and it will continue. And in the Bible, in the New Testament, it says evil people will become worse and worse. So, folks, in that sense, there's not a lot of good news, but you know what the good news for this world is, is there's still some people who believe in God, believe in truth, believe in the Bible, believe in doing what's right, believe in treating other people as made in the image of God, no matter what uh, race they are, no matter what color they are no matter what status in life they have, whether they're poor, middle class, or rich, everybody's made in the image of God, and they, be, they, they deserve to be treated that way. They deserve to be treated that way. And that's why, when you get to verse 7, we have to rest in God's promise in the midst of this corrupt world and take this in. You, God, you, O oh Lord, shall guard your people. You shall guard them, O oh Lord. You shall preserve them from this evil generation forever. In other words, you know what? God's going to be watching out for you, brother and sister. The Lord has his eye on you all the time. He never takes his eye off of you. He's watching out for you. Do you do things that... that, uh, uh, that that he, you know, he doesn't like? Do you do things that uh, anger him sometimes? Yeah. And you know what? So do I. So do I. But he keeps his eye on us. You know, Teresa quoted Romans chapter 8. Paul said, I'm thoroughly convinced. I'm thoroughly convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created being will be able to separate me from the love, will be able to separate me from the love of God. Did you hear that? And that's why we sing, his love never fails, it never gives up, it never, uh, how was that last next slide? It never gives up on me. What is it, Kelly? Oh, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails. Yeah. Man, isn't that good news, everybody? Even when we fail God, he doesn't quit loving us. Now, a loving father sometimes spanks. <laughs> Sometimes he has to put us through the ringer because we're not listening to him and get us to start listening to him again. But guess what? He'll never quit loving you. He can't. He can't. So God doesn't promise that he will immediate, re, immediately remove you from your problems, but he's going to guard you in the midst of them. Okay, so let's take this home, everybody. What are we going to take home? Okay, okay. Oh, was I supposed to show you that one? Oh, I missed. Okay, well, this goes along with what we've been saying. God's faithful, even though the wicked are prowling on every side, even though vileness is exalted among the sons of men. I, it made it into my PowerPoint and not into my notes. <laughs> so, this is what we're living in. So, what do we do? How, what do we take home from this today? Okay, very simple. First of all, I want to ask you, how you doing with your prayer life? Are you a person of prayer? That's important. Secondly, are you a person of patience? <laughs> are you patient? Thirdly, are you a person who knows God's promises? Hey, can you just all of a sudden, when something happens, can you just all of a sudden, you get bad news, can you just stop and say, Lord, Lord, count it all joy? When you fall into different trials, knowing this, the testing of your faith produces endurance. Lord, I'm going to trust you because, and I'm going to count it all joy right now. I don't know why this is happening. Okay, you get the idea. There's a gazillion promises you can run to, but do you know them? Can you just pull one right out? You start getting afraid about something. Lord, do not fear because I'm with you. Don't be afraid. I'm your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will hold you up with my righteous right hand. Can, do you have stuff that you can just go to? Just You need, need that. 
Get in the Word. Get a yellow highlighter. Start highlighting things. Start memorizing them. You'll go a long way. All right, one story and we're done. There's a man who loves hunting, and he told the following story. He said, one morning, early in the morning, I heard a number of dogs that were chasing a deer, barking and screaming and going crazy, these dogs. Looking at a large open field in front of me, I saw a baby deer making its way across the field, knowing it only had a short time to live. It jumped over some rails and crouched within 10 feet of where I stood. A second later, two dogs came over the rail and the tiny deer ran directly toward me and pushed its head between my legs. I picked it up and I held it tightly to my chest and swinging round and round, I fought the dogs off. And it was as I fought, I convinced myself that not all the dogs on planet Earth, they could not and they would not touch this tiny deer after its weakness had appealed to my strength. All the dogs in the world would not, could not and would not touch this tiny deer after its weakness had appealed to my mighty strength. And Folks, let me just tell you this. You appeal to God's mighty strength. You come to him like this deer saying, Lord, I feel like I'm getting eaten alive. I feel like I'm getting swallowed up whole. There's so much corruption going on around me. Help, Lord. And God's going to be just like that man. He's going to grip you tight. He's going to say, listen, I'll protect you. Don't be afraid. I'm your God. I'm with you. Do not be afraid. Do not fear. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, how we praise you today for your mighty word. Lord, we all so needed this today. Just a reminder of what a great God you are, Lord, hearing prayer, coming to our rescue, standing up on our behalf. And Lord, giving us your word that gives us the direction and the, and the strength and encouragement we need in the midst of a corrupt, evil, deceitful, violent, murderous world, Lord. Jesus, I pray for your precious people, Lord, how you love them. How you love them, Lord. Father, I ask that your mercies would be great toward them, especially those that are just going through a difficult, difficult time right now. Just feel like maybe God's not very close to them. I just pray today they'll go home remembering that you never give up, Lord. You never run out on us. Lord, use them this week. Say, share the good news as they touch the lives of other people, as they minister to people that aren't what they ought to be. Let your spirit rest upon them. And we pray it in the name that's above every name, the name of Jesus.